who disapproved of dancing, it was not coined by any one of us. It was said by George Bernard Shaw, a 19th century Irish playwright, a man who was not a Christian. Well, let's face it, we live in the 21st century, and society's attitudes have changed on the topic of dancing. We see or hear about it regularly in our daily lives. Schools hold dances many times a year, and teens have to decide whether or not I'm going to go. And if I go, what am I going to wear? And who am I going to go with? It's not prom season yet, but in a few short months, seniors in high school will many of be thinking about the prom and all things that go along with that. But dancing is not only for young people, though. For adults are not immune from the influence of dancing either. Whether we find dancing on television with shows like Dancing with the Stars or anything like it, whether it's at weddings or someplace else, dancing today is considered a part of everyday life, a normal way to have fun. All of this has caused many Christians to ask, what does the Bible say about dancing? Or more accurately, does the Bible condemn dancing? But before we get any further in this topic, let's, all, let's lay some ground rules before we start. Things that Christians should consider to be true. We must follow God's word and God's will in all things. In Proverbs 9 verse 10 we read, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord in this passage refers to respect for God and, the, and respect for what he says. This passage is saying that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of wisdom. What does that mean? Well, if you don't fear the Lord, you cannot begin to obtain true wisdom, the wisdom that comes from above. And in Proverbs, as you read through the entire book, who is the one in this book that is not wise? They are the fool. So if we want to truly be wise, we need to respect God and do what he says. If we have this wisdom, and if we will have knowledge. In Proverbs 9 verse 10 goes on to say that we will have insight or understanding. We get the same ideas in the New Testament as well. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 11 to 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 beginning at verse 11. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. A spiritual person judges all things, but is, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who understands the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. In this passage, Paul is trying to show the Corinthians that they don't have true knowledge and true wisdom because they're walking after the ways of the world and not after Christ. They're behaving like the world in dividing over preachers and not walking in the ways that God wants them to walk. He says, who can know the thoughts of a person except that person. I cannot know what Naomi is thinking, or Henry is thinking, or Rolan is thinking, or Sandra is thinking, unless I ask them. Likewise, it is with God. We cannot know the mind of God unless we ask him, and he reveals his mind to us. The question is, how does God speak to us today? Does he whisper in my ear, Yes, Jeremy, that's a good idea. Or does he yell, no, Jeremy, don't do that? No, we know that's not how God acts and operates today. 
In Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, we read long ago, and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Today God speaks through Jesus. And of course, we know Jesus spoke through the inspired apostles and writers of the New Testament by the Holy Spirit. These people wrote what they learned. They wrote it down for us so that we might know what the will of God is. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Paul says, If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things that I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. What Paul wrote to the Corinthians weren't Paul's commandments. They were Jesus' commandments. And that's not only true for the book of 1 Corinthians, but that was true for the book of Galatians, and the book of Romans, and the book of Titus, and the book of Philemon, and every other book that Paul wrote. It's true for the entire New Testament. Do you want to know what the will of God is? People ask that question. What is the will of God? How do I know? Pick up this book. It's found in this book. If we can find what we want to do approved of by precept or, pro or principle, then we know it's the will of God. But if it's found in this book and is condemned, we can know it's not the will of God. There's a third category that people often fail to consider. If what we want to do is not specifically found in this book, and we can find it neither approved by precept or principle, in other words, it's not specifically approved, but it's not generically approved either. We can't find it anywhere. The Bible is truly silent on it. We should avoid it because we cannot know whether it's right. It may be right. God, who knows? God may have accepted it. But we cannot know. And therefore, we should not play God. Now, people who teach this are sometimes called ultra-conservatives, extremists, or fundamentalists by those who are of a more liberal mindset. But as 1 Corinthians 2 verse 11 says, we cannot know the mind of God unless he reveals it to us. We have everything we need to know about how to be a Christian. So let's stick with that and leave those things that God is truly silent about to God. There is not one thing that I need to know that God expects of me that he has hidden from me. And when we try to go outside the bounds of God, we are truly saying, God hasn't given me everything I need to know. There are other things. No, God has given me everything I need to know. What does Colossians 3.17 say? Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever is a neat word, for it means everything. Whatever we do whether it's in the words we use or the deeds that we do, we're to do all in the name of or by the authority of Jesus. That means if we can't do something or say something by the authority of Jesus, we either shouldn't do it or we shouldn't say it. That's just as clear as Colossians 3 can be. So what about dancing? We're going to read a set of verses in a row, and I'd like you to, as we read them, I'd like you to pay close attention to where the word dancing is mentioned in each of them. So we're going to go through all of those verses listed on the screen. We're going to do it without really talking about them uh, as we pass. We're just going to read them all. And I want you to pay attention to where dancing is mentioned specifically in each of them. First one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who've sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. Now turn to Galatians 5. Let's read verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Next, you can probably listen along because I'm probably going to go too fast. We can go to Colossians chapter 3. Read verses 5 through 7. Colossians 3, beginning at verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. What the first three verses have in common is that they all condemn certain types of living. Now let's go and find some verses that specifically tell us 
how Christians are to live, and what we are to have given up in order to come to Christ. The first one is in Titus 2. In Titus 2, let's read verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now let's go to 1 Peter 2, read verse 11. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Now skip ahead two chapters and turn to 1 Peter 4, verses 3 and 4. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, <coughs> and passions, and drunkenness, and orgies, and drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. Now as we read through all of these sets of verses, all six sets, did anyone catch where the word dancing is mentioned in each of them? No. Because we didn't find a verse that said, Thou shalt not dance. And since it's not there, many people, many religious people, say that since it's not there, we have liberty to practice all of the types of dancing we see today, like the tango, or the salsa, or the waltz, or whatever other type of dance people want to come up with today. Those are old-fashioned dances that I mentioned. Uh, there are many new dances that uh, the younger generation have come up with that would fit into those same categories. Dances where there's a lot of movement of your body, uh, you, uh, with partners and, and everything that goes along with that. We're allowed to do that. People say we have liberty to do that so long as it doesn't lead us to the sins that are clearly condemned in Scripture, like lust and fornication. Leaving aside the fact that the people who make this argument don't have a shred of scriptural authority to say that, either by precept or principle, they don't have a shred of scriptural authority that would support God's approval of many modern dances, I have the question, are these dances really excluded from the passages that we just read? In three of the six verses we read, we have the word sensuality mentioned in the version that I read. According to Bynes Dictionary of New Testament words, sensuality comes from the Greek word aselgia, which means licentiousness. Licentiousness is another big word. That means promiscuous or unprincipled in sexual matters. It means absent of restraint and indecency. That's what that word sensuality means. Then we read in Colossians 3, 5 to 7, a word called impurity. Some versions, if you have the New King James or the King James, would have uncleanness, which according to Thayer's Greek English lexicon of the New Testament means lustful or luxurious, prof or profligate or reckless living. Lustful or reckless living. The two other verses we read did not contain either of those words, impurity or sensuality but did talk about abstaining from fleshly or worldly passions. Now these two words, sensuality and impurity, these words are not commonly used in everyday language and everyday society. They are so uncommon that I'd venture to guess that outside of a Bible study context, pra practically nobody in this audience used either of these two words in conversation this past week. That's how rare they actually come up. Because they are so common, though, the Bible believer generally doesn't know what they mean and therefore has no idea whether they actually are committing these types of sins. When we read lists of sins and we say, you know, I don't know what that means. Is it a good idea not to look up what that means? Or is it just saying, well, I don't know what it means. I hope I'm not doing it and that's, that's good enough. No. We need to know what the Bible is talking about. What does it being sensual or impure look like? Well, it can occur when both men and women dress immodestly. Our clothing is not to be so tight that all of the contours of our body are visible for all to see, nor so loose that people can gaze under our clothing when we bend down to pick something up or our clothing practically falls off 
when we walk. But being sensual or impure doesn't just involve our clothing. If we walk around shaking our hips, our chest, our waist, or contorting our bodies in ways that are considered sexual in nature, that is a way of being sensual or impure. Moreover, it can occur by touching the opposite sex, or even the same sex, in ways that can be unwelcome and inappropriate in any other setting. Without getting too graphic, if I walked up to any woman in this room and put my arms around their waist or around their back, that would be inappropriate and it would be wrong. That would be acting in a sensual or impure way, and it would be sin. Behaving in this way stirs up desires, not only in ourselves, but in others as well. But when you step back and <coughs> think over the descriptions of impurity and sensuality that I just gave, do you want to know what I'm describing here? A vast majority of modern dances. I don't advise it, but if you turn on Dancing with the Stars and turn down the music or the sound on your television, what would you see? People dressed provocatively, moving around and contorting their bodies in a sexual way, no. while promoting the thoughts of lust on themselves and their partner and everyone else who's watching. How can a Christian engage in such things and think that they're not sinning? Now, some might say, well, I don't have those thoughts. And since I can't control what other people think, no matter the situation, as long as I don't sin, that's all that matters. First of all, 1 Corinthians 12, or 10, 12 says, Let anyone who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. If we put ourselves in places where it is easy to sin, and where everyone else is sinning, let's not think of ourselves as so strong that we won't sin as well. But even if it is true, and you aren't thinking sexual or sensual or impure thoughts, what does your example do to others who are watching? And while we can't control the minds of others, we can certainly assist them by acting in a sensual and pure way ourselves. In Matthew 18, Jesus said in verses 5 to 7, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. I fear that all too often Christians think as long as they don't sin, that's really all God cares about. Well, that's absolutely not true. What did Jesus say in this verse? It would be better for a millstone, a very heavy stone. We're not talking about little pebbles you find on the ground. We're talking a big, huge, boulder type stone. It would be better for that type of stone to be tied around your neck and you to be cast into the sea than for you to cause someone else to sin. In other words, it would be better for you to die than to cause someone else to sin. But why? Because by causing someone else to sin, not only are you sinning yourself and endangering your soul, but you're endangering the soul of someone else. When we tempt someone with our actions or our words, Jesus tells us that we're doing wrong ourselves. He pronounces woe, meaning deep suffering, on the person who does this. Where in the scriptures is the pronouncement of woe ever a good thing? Let's not kid ourselves, though. Contorting our body in many ways and touching someone else's body during dancing is sensual. It is impure, it is licentious, and it is lustful, not only for us, but for those around us. The Bible is not silent on the modern dances of today, and therefore we need to avoid them. It is at this point, though, that those who want to try and justify modern dancing being practiced in, by, and by Christians turn to the Old Testament and say, well, doesn't Ecclesiastes 3 verse 4 say that there is a time to dance? And didn't David dance in the Old Testament? Like with all things, though, when we use a phrase, and just a phrase, a small phrase in Scripture, it is important not to rip it out of its context and give it a meaning that merely suits our purpose. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let's read the entire section. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 to 8. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, time to be born and a time to die 
time to, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time, of, a time to love and a time of hate, a time of war and a time of peace. In this passage, the preacher, King Solomon, expresses the idea that there is a specific time to do everything we want to do. In verses 2 to 8, he proceeds to list off 14 things that there is a time for, like birth and planting and weeping and seeking. And then he proceeds or, uh, to list or compare 14 opposite things to the one he just mentioned that there is a time for. So not only is there a time to be born, there is also a time to die. There's not only a time to plant, but there's a time to harvest. Birth is the opposite of death, just as planting is the opposite of harvesting. Now coming to verse 4, we find there is a time to dance. But dancing is the second phrase. What is dancing the opposite of? Morning. A time of mourning is a time of sadness. Well, the dancing spoken of here is a time of joy and a time of gladness. That's the opposite of mourning. The preacher is not saying there's a time to be sad and then there's a time to be lustful and improperly sexual. Those two thoughts don't go together. No, what he's saying is there's a time to be sad, but there's also a time to be happy. The dances spoken of here aren't modern dances. They're, they're dances of joy. They're dances of happiness. They're not done in pairs. They're done on our own. So, okay, so having dealt with that, let's move on to David. Do the scriptures say he danced? Turn to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And let's read verses 15 and 16. 2 Samuel 6, beginning in verse 15. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. You can read the entire context on your own time. I'm just focusing on what David was doing here. Does this verse say David danced? Absolutely. Was it a lascivious, lustful, or sensual dance? Before you answer, I'm not going to deal with it here, but I would invite you to read the alternate uh, uh, account in 1 Chronicles as well, because it adds to what we think here. Most people think that this was a lustful, licentious, or sensual dance, because they think David was walking around naked. 1 Chronicles would tell us he's not. If he was, that would be the problem not the specific dance, because the dance here was not a licentious, sensual dance. He was leaping and dancing before the Lord. Dancing is just movement. That's what the word means. Uh, usually attached to music, and it was here, but dancing is simply movement. It's the type of movement that's the problem. The Ark of the Covenant here was being brought into Jerusalem. This was a time of celebration and happiness. And instead of involving sensual and sexual dance moves, the dances spoke of here in Ecclesiastes 3 involved jumping around. In today's society, we might also involve giving high fives to people, fist bumps, or something like that. Each person does his own dance without the need of a partner. And this dance is, is in response to being thrilled, not an effort to get a thrill. If you want to know what these types of dances look like, watch an NFL football player after he scores a touchdown. Now, I'm not saying every one of their celebrations are right and wholesome, but in a general way, these are dances of joy. Another example would have been from last week. Now, many people here probably aren't NFL football fans, but a few people in the audience I know are. And I wasn't at Bill and Tammy's house last Sunday night, and I don't know how excited they get when their New England Patriots win, 
But when Danny, Danny Amendola, one of the Patriots' wide receivers, caught the touchdown pass that gave the team the lead with under three minutes to go, I'm sure there was excitement. I was texting them. I know there was. I wasn't there to see it. In some people's homes, maybe not theirs, but in some people's homes, there would be people jumping up and down in sh literally sheer joy. What you would be witnessing would be people dancing, but not immoral dancing joyful dancing. Whether music is added or not is irrelevant, for it's easy to spot and discern the difference between a dance of joy and a sensual, licentious dance. One promotes happiness and excitement, while the other promotes lust and sexuality. Want to know the difference? Go look at the dance that uh, Herod watched and the result that occurred after it. John the Baptist was beheaded because Herod saw a licentious, sensual dance and made a promise he should not have made because he liked what he saw. That's the difference. The one is sinful, the lustful dancing, and must be, must not be, participated in by Christians. While the other is not sinful, the dance of joy, and may, may be participated in by Christians. The key is to know the difference and not to engage in sin ourselves and cause others to sin. I guess I was behind by one. This brings me to my final point. What about husbands and wives? Can't they dance? Even those dances that you mentioned that would be sensual, can they dance those types of dances? The answer is yes and no. It is true that married men and women may participate in activities with each other that would be sinful for unmarried people to participate in. <clears throat> Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Sex with your spouse or behaving sexually with your spouse is not sinful. In fact, it is normal and approved of by God. In 1 Corinthians 7, 2 to 5, we read, But because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. For the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again. So Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. What would be considered lost in fornication outside of marriage is totally acceptable between a married couple. In fact, Paul said this is one of the purposes of marriage. Not the only purpose, but one of the purposes of marriage. To fulfill our sexual desires. When considering sex inside of marriage, that would also include these dances that would be in a more sensual way. However, just because sex between a married couple is approved of by God, that doesn't mean he approves of it to be done everywhere. Sex in public places or places where people are likely to be watching would cause others to lust after you and therefore should not be done. The same thing goes with sensual dancing. In the privacy of our own home or our own bedroom, a married, and when a married couple is alone, they, if they were to dance in this way, the only passions they'd be stirring up are those of their partner. And these would therefore be totally acceptable to God. So in conclusion, let's remember, whenever we want to do something, we need to ask if God would approve. We know if God approves of something, if we can find it by precept or principle in His Word. In Galatians 5, verses 22 to 24, we read, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. There isn't any law against being joyful, or loving, or patient, or kind, because these are the fruits of the Spirit. So if, we want, if what we want to do can truly be classified into some of these categories, then it is righteous for us to do it. However, the vast majority of today's modern dances cannot be classified into the fruits of the Spirit, for they are sensual, lustful, and impure. 
And those who belong to Christ are to free themselves of these types of sinful passions and desires. Instead of trying to justify why we can become more like this world, let's seek to conform ourselves to Christ and become more like him each and every day. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause. Maintain the honors of his word.